morning. I want to say a quick word about the deacon nominations um, going into this. I know Scott gave kind of a, an introduction to, to deacons and the nomination process last week. Um, I, just, so I just want to say a quick word about it, which is just that, um, just a, generally speaking, a deacon, to understand the fundamental difference between deacons and elders is that um, elders are in charge of the, the ultimate spiritual oversight of the church. We are to give ourselves to the word of God and to prayer. And that doesn't mean we, we hold up in a closet praying and reading the Bible. It means we administer the word of God and prayer to the people as there is need. It means we're available for spiritual care, spiritual oversight. Um, we oversee the ministries of the church, the teaching, um, and all the other things that happen that edify and feed the body as, as shepherds. Um, deacons are assistants to the elders. And what they do is they take things off the elders' plates so that the elders can give themselves to the word of God and prayer. And so the deacons, they do, it is a spiritual role. I mean, not to, not to, we don't want to be careful that it doesn't get minimized. The only difference in the requirements between a deacon and an elder is that a deacon doesn't necessarily have to be able to teach um, in terms of what the scripture says. So it is a spiritual role and deacons participate in spiritual work. And they have to be able to do that because they might come alongside somebody initially to meet a practical need, but they find out that there's a deeper need, a spiritual need, and they, so they can be available to pray and to care for the people of the church as a part of their ministry. So how to know if you might be called to the office of deacon? One, one of the trademarks of a deacon is they do not ever want to be up here. That's one of the, that is kind of like one of the defining characteristics. I think don't put me in front of the people unless I have to, but put me back somewhere behind the scenes and let me just serve. I want to give, I want to do, I want to help, I want to, but, I, but don't put me up in front of people. Generally, that's what deacons say. There are, there are a few exceptions. For example, Mitchell Duncan is the lead deacon and he's a-okay with, with being in front of everybody and, and all that. So people are wired differently. It's not a, de- a definite thing, but that's just one of the things that most deacons you'll hear them say. It's like, You know what I mean? There's people who are like, man, I want to teach the word of God. And deacons are like, please, anything but teaching. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, put me, can I take out the garbage? Could I do these things? It's like, yeah, yeah. But I mean, we, there's, there's a lot to it. So they want to be just kind of hidden in the, in the background, but um, they, they do so much for the church. If you have been, if you have um, had any contact with the deacons, you know, when you have, when something goes on in the church and there's a need, I mean, they are there and they are a blessing. And I'm telling you, so much has been taken off of the elders' place that we've been able to really expand our work in terms of pastoral care, teaching ministry, and other things that we're doing with the church that's been really important. So be prayerful about your nominations, um, but but, um, definitely, if there's somebody who stands out to you as a good nomination, we want to hear from you about that. And those nominations go into a nomination committee where we go through them and make sure that the nominations are people who are qualified for the position. And then from a select group from those nominations, we'll pursue the candidates. And then we'll present that to the church for a review process um, where you can say, this person got nominated, but I have questions about the nomination. And that'll go for two weeks. And we have a process in place. And then finally, the installment of the deacons. So that's just a kind of a, does that make it somewhat clear? Some clear enough. So the forms are in the back. They have the scriptures to read. We want you to read those scriptures first um, and answer the questions. And then we don't talk to nominees about where, hey, put in a good word for you today, buddy, kind of a thing. You know, we don't talk to the nominees. We keep that entirely private until the process is complete. So um, I think I've said all there is to say about that. If you have questions, let us know. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your word and for the grace that we receive from your mouth, the words, the gracious words falling from your mouth. Thank you for the life that's in it. Thank you, Lord, that when you challenge us, Lord, you come alongside us and help us. Thank you, Lord God, that um, that when we live before your face, Lord, everything else seems, God, to find its place. And so I'm calling on your name this morning to lead us in the way we should go as we go through your word together. And I pray that you'd strengthen us, you'd challenge us, Lord God, you'd equip us, and that also, Lord, um, you would enable us through grace to walk in your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, um, so 
this message today I'll be sharing with you is something, many times messages that I, I share in here are coming from things that I'm studying or things that God is showing me, just or things he's speaking to me about. And so today I'm going to be sharing with you from Mark 11 and, and Micah chapter 7, which are parallel passages. They, it's, it's the same, I don't want to say the same exact story, but it's the same, it's kind of the same thing twice. One prophesies about the other. And, but the themes that run through them are the same. And so I want to show you this passage um, in the context of the fruit that Jesus is seeking. So let's look at Mark chapter 11 to begin, 11 through 14. Jesus entered Jerusalem and came into the temple. And after looking around at everything, he left for Bethany with the twelve since it was already late. On the next day, When they had left Bethany, he became hungry. Seeing at a distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. So let's just pause right there. Um, Does anybody read that? passage and think to yourself, well, what was, what was up with Jesus that day? Seems like kind of an overreaction. I mean, the writer even made sure to point out it was not the season for figs. And you read that and you go, not the season for figs. So he went and looked for figs. He found no figs and that's reasonable. That's, that's, that'd be a, a, a reasonable kind of way to look at it. So what was Jesus so worked up about? Because Jesus went to a fig tree, not in the season for figs, so the fig tree would have been in leaf, but not with fruit. And digs through the leaves, finds no fruit. But here's the thing. Jesus was hungry. He was hungry for the fruit that that tree would give. And so he goes to the tree seeking fruit, finds no fruit, and he says, this tree will never bear fruit again. And he takes that tree, and in essence, he pushes it aside. This tree's done. It's off the, (laughs) it's out of the running. It's not going to make fruit anymore. And it says his disciples were listening. So what I want to talk to you about today is something that we, we call, or I call, it's a phrase from Hebrews, the word of righteousness. And the word of righteousness is a word that Um, according to the book of Hebrews, will lead you from a place of milk to being able to receive meat. And that's a matter of um, maturity, growth in godliness. In the book of Hebrews, he writes to the church and he says, many of you ought to be teachers by now. He says, you ought to be able to take what you've learned, be mature in it, and pass that word along to other people. He said, but you have need of milk not me, not solid food. And he says, and you have need for the elementary oracles of the Christ, the early teachings, the elementary teachings of Christ to be taught to you all over again. And then the phrase that he uses is, he says, not being acquainted with the word of righteousness. And so your acquaintance, your familiarity with the word of righteousness is what will take you on to maturity. So let me tell you what the word of righteousness is. We just did this in our discipleship class. Maybe I should have one of my students come up and and tell us what the word of righteousness is. Does anybody want to give it a shot? Does anybody feel bold? So this is not going to be a good recruiting moment for my discipleship class. Anybody want to try? I'll give you a chance. They don't want to come up here. It's all good. I'll do it. So the word, they're going through notes though. That's good. But the word of righteousness is this simply. <clears throat> Jesus paid everything for you at the cross. Everything that you could ever need for life and godliness, his divine power has granted to you through the work that he did on the cross. And you have been declared righteous in the presence of God through faith because of what Jesus has done for you. Can we all agree on that? And this is the beginning, this is the first teaching 
that, that leads to faith in Christ. You hear this teaching, it's what Jesus did, we call it the gospel, the good news message of what Jesus did at the cross, and <clears throat> that reality that everything has been done, settled for you through the work of Jesus, um, we believe in it, and we believe in it, when we believe in it, it's literally life-changing. Because when you accept that truth, that Jesus has paid it all, and that he has settled your debt with God forever, you become a new creature, a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. You still with me? This is what the Bible teaches about salvation and the new birth. It is by grace, through faith, apart from works, so that no one can boast. That's the gospel message. And it's good news. And it's the best news that a suffering sinner can receive. Because you've sought, sought out all the other paths you might take, and they all came to nothing. But Jesus offered real hope, real answers, because you realize the problem was not with me wanting to do better. The problem was not with me, you know, be, you know the problem was with follow through. There was, it was not in me to do the right thing or to even to be right, to have right desires. But Jesus changed all that. The new creature has God's nature, fundamental to who we are. So we want what he wants. We love what he loves. We hate what he hates. And that nature is in us, and it's transforming us and competing with the old nature, which is dead and dying, however that works. There's mysteries, but you're still with me. Are you still with me? Okay, so you have a new nature in you now. That new nature wants to live for God. Um, it fights with the old nature, which is opposing, opposing the things of God. The word of righteousness is what Peter talks about when he says... Having believed all these things, in 2 Peter chapter 1, having accepted that everything has been finished for you at the cross, now add to your faith. In other words, if you're going to grow, lay hold of grace, which was purchased for you at the cross, and begin to take certain actions. And the difference in the actions that you take after you've believed the gospel is that you take all of these actions based upon the grace of God. You're not, so, 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 so let's just take, for example, because we're going to talk about this this morning, you want to have a prayer life. You've got a couple of options, a couple of ways you can go. I don't have a much of a prayer life. I need to have a prayer life, so here's what I'll do. I'll go back to law and see how that does for me. And so you start by condemning yourself for not having prayed enough. Then you say, but I should pray. And I know that I must pray. And so, by God's grace, you say it, but you don't even, ha in some cases, have an idea what that even means. You say, I will begin to pray. But you're not really drawing your strength from grace. You're strong, drawing your strength from yourself. So then you try to have a prayer life. But having condemned yourself, recognized that, you know, subjecting yourself to the, law, to the word of God as though it were simply a law and a commandment that must be kept and thinking that you must find the strength in yourself to do it, you fail. I could ask for a show of hands and it wouldn't have to be prayer. It could be any number of things. You want to overcome some temptation or some sin, some other virtue that you want to see established. I'm not a very patient person, whatever it is. And you seek to establish that thing in your own life by your own strength and you fall flat on your face and you fail. That's the first way you could try to have a prayer life, if you want to take that example. The other way is, you could start, instead of going back and putting yourself under law and condemnation, put yourself under the cross of Jesus. And you go back to the cross of Jesus and you say, Jesus bought, bought everything I could ever need for life and godliness. What I'm not talking about here is a prayer life, which is a need for life and it pertains to godliness. So it's covered, it's purchased at the cross. So he's already bought it for me. So now, by faith, I'm going to enter into the presence of God, the throne of, what's it called? The throne of, starts with a G, the throne of grace, to obtain grace and mercy to help me in my time of need. I lay hold of this empowering thing called grace. I, by faith, I lay hold of grace. I bring grace down into my life through faith, the God, faith that God has put in me. I mean, he's the source of everything. And now I say, by the grace of God, knowing what it means that he is a helper to me by the Holy Spirit, I will pray. 
And I begin to pray, not based on, I haven't been good enough, I need to do better, and I feel so bad about myself. That's, un, that's law, that's gone, done away with through the cross of Jesus. Instead, it's, he loves me, he paid the price, this is now possible, it was impossible, and my own strength is now possible through him, so I will pray. I'll discipline myself, but the Holy Spirit produces the fruit of self-discipline. So it's all of grace. And by the grace of God, I will persevere in this new thing, and I will pray. So read 2 Peter chapter 1. He says, add this virtue. When you've got this one kind of up and running, then get this one going. And then when this one's up and running, get this one going. And keep on going until you reach like the pinnacle of all virtue, which is Christian love. The love which God has for us, now being shown by us to other people. And that's the word of righteousness. And the word of righteousness causes many people to stumble. Not being acquainted with it. They say, hold on a second, pastor, you're trying to put us under law. Well, that's why I took all this time to explain the difference. Because I'm not putting you under law. If you go back to law and condemnation as a basis of future growth in Christ, you're, 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 you're drawing, like you're in the new covenant, trying to get power from the old covenant. So you stay in this covenant, and you lay hold of the grace of God. Look, if, if, if what Jesus did at the cross can't create, pardon my terminology, better people, Then what the law could make, then we are in an inferior covenant, not a superior one. Can we not agree with that? People are like hesitant to agree or disagree. It's a lot. I realize it's deep, but we have to consider it. The the new creature that's in you is Jesus. The new nature that's in you is Jesus' nature. And the power of sin has been broken. Is that true? Right. And so the new covenant makes possible what the old covenant never could. But you and I have to embrace works, that is, good works, ordained for you before the foundation of the world, that you would walk in them. You and I have to embrace the good that we should do. Because as someone has said, you cannot do God's part, and God will not do yours. And that's the word of righteousness. So I'm going to share a word with you today that pertains to the word of righteousness. It would fit in this category. So this teaching about the fig tree is a teaching about the importance of righteousness in the lives of God's people. Because you and I could reach a place if we weren't cautious, if we weren't diligent in the pursuit of our faith, if we weren't careful, we could end up in a place that we went from a time that we did produce fruit for God and were a blessing to many to being a place that we were fruitless, fruitless and cast aside. So I want to show, so the fig tree, like so many of Jesus' teachings, the object of the teaching, which was the fig tree, was not the point. He was teaching his disciples something much deeper and more significant. You understand this. Jesus Jesus wasn't angry at that tree Jesus had gone into Jerusalem, and, or he was headed into Jerusalem, and when he got into Jerusalem, he, he cursed the tree on his way in, but he knew what he was going to find in Jerusalem. When he got into Jerusalem, it says he looked all around. He went into the temple, and he looked all around that place. I want to show you a parallel passage, Micah 7, 1 through 6, and I want you to imagine Jesus saying these words, not the prophet Micah. Woe is me, for I am like the fruit pickers, like the grape gatherers. Why is that a woe is me? Normally, that's a good thing, right? You get out there, and the harvest is a time of rejoicing. But here's the reason. There's not a cluster of grapes to eat or a first ripe fig which I crave. You see that? Woe is me, because I came seeking a first ripe fig, and there wasn't a fig To eat. But what does he mean by that? Verse 2 tells us the godly person has perished from the land, and there is no upright person among men. All of them lie in wait for bloodshed. Each of them hunts the other with a net. Concerning evil, both hands do it well. The prince asks, also the judge, for a bribe. And a great man speaks the desire of his soul, which means a person of influence says, Well, this is what I'd like to happen, and there's all this corruption. 
so they weave it together. The best of them is like a briar, the most upright like a thorn hedge. The day when you post your watchman, which is a picture of listening to a word of caution, there's trouble coming, post the watchman. Watchmen are also a picture of prayer. They're a picture of people of prayer. The, the watchmen are the ones who pray. They're the ones who watch, watch and pray. The day that you're ready to either take caution or begin to pray, your punishment will come. Then their confusion will occur. It'll just be chaos. I want to explain this to you. There have always been and always will be the righteous and the wicked. Those terms are used as general, kind of broad, sweeping terms all throughout the Bible. But among God's people, though, there is always a third category. And that's those whose lives were once fruitful, but have ceased to seek after God or follow Him. So they bear no fruit. Or worse, they bear the fruit of the ungodly. So have you ever heard the term backslidden, backslider? The Bible uses that term. Um, there's a place in Jeremiah where he says, behold, your backsliding will rebuke you. In other words, the punishment of backsliding is built into backsliding. When you've been following after God and you turn away from him and begin to go your own way, there's a punishment built into it. It's just sowing and reaping. You're sowing a different seed. You're, you were sowing the seeds of righteousness, so, now, so you, rep, you, re, you reaped the reward of righteousness. Now you're sowing a different seed. And so guess what's happening? Trouble is piling up and coming into your life. And that's what backsliding is. And backsliding is one of the most painful things in the world to experience because you think, I'll just take one step into sin, and that's going to be what I'll do. But they used to say, and I don't know if it's a still a going expression, but they used to say sin will take you farther than you wanted to go, keep you longer than you wanted to stay, and make you pay more than you thought or more than you ever wanted to pay. And that's the truth. You want to take one step, but it's backsliding. You stepped onto a slippery slope, and guess what? You were in control when you took the first step, but you're not in control anymore. Now it's spinning out of control. And other people have to watch it, watch it happen to you. People who pray for you, people who love you have to watch it happen. And it breaks their hearts. And guess what? They're crying out to God. And they're praying that things will change for you. But you're just cascading out of control in this thing that maybe you never even saw coming. Did you guys ever play shoots and ladders? You know that game? You roll a dice, you land somewhere, you climb the ladders, and you, if you get it right, you know, you climb a bunch of ladders, maybe you take one little shoot, but then you get another ladder, and you get all the way to like the, there's like, there's like the, the goal, like you're at the end, you've won the game, but you land on the spot right before the end of the game, and guess what that is? One big slide that takes you all the way back to the beginning, and that is the most frustrating game in the entire world, is it not? It's like, I can't tell you how many times like, I hit that slide. It's like it's got my name. You, know, you roll the dice, you're like, Lord, they, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. I'm on the slide. Thank you. I needed, I needed to be humbled. <clears throat> but, but that's what it's like for you. When you turn away from God, that's what it's like for others to watch it happen to you. But people backslide, and guess what? They had so much scripture memorized. And you know what? You find they can't recall those scriptures anymore. But you know why? Because God took them back. I've watched this happen. I knew somebody was so versed in the Bible, they could do verse and chapter and perf word perfect memorization of all these passages. They were in sin for five years and wouldn't turn back. And I heard them quoting scripture. It was the most garbled mess you'd ever heard. It was half a verse here, half a verse there, misquoted. They had, it was gone. God took it back. Those words are precious. They were trying to use scripture to defend themselves, to defend their own lifestyle and choices. And God took it back. I'm just telling you. So this kind of thing is difficult to, to face, but it's real. And here's what I want to say to the church. If any one of us thinks that we could never be in that place, we need to wake up. And you need to wake up right now. Because if you're playing with fire, the scripture says, can a man take fire into his bosom and not be burned? Could you reach into, I mean, you couldn't hardly pick up the fire without being burned, but to take it to yourself is to say to bring it into your own life. 
Could you bring sin? Could you bring darkness in? Could you mess around with stuff that's like, like occult origins and all this dark things? Could you spend a lot of time like taking in movies and music and shows and all this stuff that's just full of wickedness and darkness and not be burned? And yet the church is just like, well, I'm, I'm the exception. I'm the exception. It won't, it won't hurt me. And yet the fact is, unless the Bible's wrong, unless Jesus was not telling us the truth, it is impossible for you to take it in without it hurting you. Guess what? The Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. Guess how much darkness he likes? None. Because what does it say about God? It says, God in whom there is no darkness at all. So his objective for you is no darkness. And what we say is, how much darkness can I play with? How much fire can I take in to my bosom? Maybe I'll just burn this shirt, but the rest of me will be okay. You know, and we play with fire. We do it a lot. But your life is precious, and I want you to know this. And it's important for you to understand it. Your life is precious. And because your life is precious, there is a target on you. There's a target on every one of us. And your life was made precious by the blood of Jesus. You were bought with the highest price, which means you are precious to God. Every one of us. And if that's the case, you have to recognize there are spiritual powers that want your destruction. Your own flesh is on their side. And all the temptations of the world are tailored to appeal to your flesh. And the ultimate objective is, first of all, that you would love the world. And loving the world become an enemy of God. And becoming an enemy of God to act out in ways that would never, not only not bring glory to God, but would bring total dishonor to the name of the Lord through your life. The same one who was redeemed for God, but not bearing any fruit or bearing the other fruit. So <clears throat> this was Jesus' intense frustration. The people of God are not godly. They do not stand apart in the world. The master went to the bush that was supposed to have figs, and he said, I want a fig from this bush. Well, there was no fruit. And being no fruit, Jesus said, well, then you'll never bear fruit again. And he put it aside. First of all, like I talked about, why do we say, well, there was not the season for figs, but what did Paul say to Timothy? He said, be ready, Timothy, preach the word, be ready, in season and out. Do you, do you remember that verse? In other words, be ready to bear fruit, whether it's the season for fruit or not by your estimation, because God could call on you at any time. You know what I mean? And nobody wants to prepare for a crisis until the crisis comes. But you, don't, you only find out who you are when a crisis comes. It doesn't, you don't have time to prepare. Whatever you are, you are when the crisis comes. But God calls on his children who are ready to respond in a crisis. And if he calls on us and there's no fruit... He has to move on, move past you, find someone else who, who is ready and bearing fruit. <clears throat> the master, well, let's look at Mark 11, 15, or 20. As they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. That is what you call completely dead. The tree is dead. Being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And... Here's what I want to challenge you in. I'm challenging the church to say, like, we need to be in position and ready to bear fruit for God. I want people to resist the temptation right now to polarize on this teaching. I want you to resist the temptation to say, well, it's all, there's heaven and there's hell. And according to this, if I'm not bearing the right fruit for God, he's going to th throw me into hell and that's going to be it. You say, lost my salvation or whatever phrase you want to use. It's like, hold on a second. Hold on, hold on, hold on. What if the whole teaching here is sidelined. What if the whole teaching here is you get put on the shelf? He comes to you seeking fruit. You got your excuses and your reasons. And he says, well, that's okay, but I'm just not going to call on you anymore. Now, listen, we live in a covenant of grace, don't we? And anyone who repents, if, you know, if God tells us to forgive 70 times seven, our brother who sins against us in the very same way, don't you think he's doing that for us? You can come back from this place, but the caution is we can be pushed aside and sidelined if we are not bearing fruit for God. And that's not something that I think any of us wants to consider. I hope. I hope not. 
Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you curse is withered. So the master comes to the tree to receive fruit from it. There is no fruit. The master casts the tree aside, never able to bear fruit again. Never to bear fruit again. And but for the grace of, and patience of God, this would be the fate of every backslider and willful, persistent sinner under, among God's people. If God were not patient, and if God were not full of grace, there would be so many people cast aside. Isn't it true? But I like what he, the writer of Hebrews said. He said, but we are confident, after writing those horrifying passages in Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10, he says, but we're confident of better things concerning you, things that accompany salvation. We are confident of better things concerning you, things that accompany salvation. And that's because God is full of mercy, God is full of grace, and he restores us. <clears throat> when Jesus went into Jerusalem, I didn't put this passage up there. He's on his way into Jerusalem, he curses the fig tree. He goes into Jerusalem, and what's the first thing that he does when he gets into Jerusalem? He purges the temple. And this is very significant, because that temple was his father's house. That temple was the place of worship in Jerusalem. It was the center of worship, but that was a copy and a shadow. And there is a fulfillment, an ultimate temple that was going to be the house of God forever, and who knows what it was. Anybody want to say? What was the temple in the new covenant? What is the temple of the Holy Spirit? We are. We are. And this is why Jesus has this haphazard attitude. And his disciples are like, oh, Lord, look what beautiful buildings. And Jesus said, yeah, they're all going to get torn down and all the stones will be. Because the temple was, it was, the temple was just about done. It wasn't going to be necessary anymore after the cross. Because that kind of worship was over and done with. And now, every single person was going to be the temple of God. So now let's go back to the purging of the temple. And let's consider that with the New Testament glasses on. So what does that mean with your heart? And your mind? And your life? What's Jesus going to make a first priority of? He makes an example of a fig tree so it doesn't have to happen to people. And he says this. And he says... Then he, well, then he goes into the temple and he says, we got money changers here. They're doing this all for profit. We got people selling offerings for a profit. He's like, you've turned my father's house into a place of business, a robber's den. He said, but my father's house is a house of prayer. So again, with your New Testament glasses on, you are the temple of God. And he says, his father's house is a house of prayer. What does that say about your life? That your life should be a house of prayer a temple of the Holy Spirit, a place where the worship of God, a place consecrated for the worship of God and Him only. Am I unfairly distorting the Scriptures right now? Am I simply applying what's been there all along and saying, this is what He called us to do, but Jesus bought this at the cross for us. This is why it's the word of righteousness. It's not law. He calls you into this tremendous life of holiness, purity, righteousness, submission to God, but then he walks with you and helps you. Jesus was the one who purged the temple. Isn't that true? So you find out you got robber's den going on in your heart. Well, who's going to purge it? You and your strength? Or can you call on the name of the Lord and so be saved once again from everything that's trying to destroy you? Jesus will come in. He'll sit down and make the whip. He does that, I think, in the Gospel of John. He makes the whip with his own hands. And then he'll show up in the temple of your heart, and he'll start driving things out. And he's going to be real inconsiderate about it at a in a variety of ways. You're going to have a, a table covered in little tiny coins, and he's just going to whoosh. Just flip that. You know how annoying that is to pick up all those coins? Down in the cracks of the temple floor. It's like, Jesus didn't care. He says, it's got to go. I have, no, I have no reason to show respect for this. It doesn't belong here. And these are the things that God is speaking to us about in our own hearts. <clears throat> so Jesus goes on to speak to us. You need to read the Bible this way too. God is speaking to us through what is said here. You're saying it to his disciples, but you need to have ears to hear it yourself. About three aspects of a godly life that must be protected for us to flourish. 
And that if neglected, they will certainly cause us to wither spiritually. So Jesus now responds to what was said to him by Peter. Peter said, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you have cursed has withered. And in verse 22, it says, Jesus answered, saying to them. So he's responding to the comment about the withered tree. And he says, in response to this, let me say a few things to you, fellas. First of all, have faith in God. And listen to the next verse. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. That's a pretty bold statement, isn't it? But where, where did he start? Did he say, hey, fellas, have faith in all the things you can think of. Have, have faith in the things that you can say. Did he have to say, have faith in your words? What did he say? Have faith in God. Fix your hope on God. And when, because when you look at circumstances, it's so easy to, to get discouraged. Isn't that true? But when you look at God, people say, well, Lord, how can anybody be saved? Jesus said the rich people were going to have a hard time. And then his disciples said, Lord, then who can be saved? And he said, with these things, with man, it's impossible. But my eyes aren't fixed on man. They're fixed on God. And with God, all things are possible. So that's a different perspective. So he said, have faith in God. And he said, and then God's going to lead you to speak to things. It'll be a part of your prayer life. And this is important for us to understand. You have speaking to mountains in your life is an important part of the practice of your faith. And I know, look, I have to address this because it comes up from time to time. But like there's the word of faith movement and people have abused all kind of stuff. They said, well, you can speak anything you want. Speak blessings, speak riches, speak wealth, speak this, speak everything, speak health, speak it all. You speak it and God is obligated to do it. God is your servant and you're in charge. And that's wicked. It's not the word. That's not what the word of God teaches. But are you going to throw this out because somebody else took it too far? And this is the challenge because I know that there are people who are. Boom, I'm not, I'm not declaring anything because I don't believe in it. It's like, no, you don't believe the word of faith, guys, and you're right not to. But don't throw Jesus' teachings out because somebody took it too far. You need to pay attention to the words that come out of your mouth. And when your heart is full of faith, this is what Paul said, not Kenneth Copeland. Paul said, having the same spirit of faith, we believe, therefore, we also speak. And so we got to, don't let anybody steal from you the sound teachings of the word of God because they took them too far. Somebody should say amen to that. But maybe you're feeling convicted a little because you've thrown a few things out. We've all done it. But come back to center. Come back to center. So having that faith, you speak to the mountains in your life in faith. And Jesus said, don't doubt in your heart. Resist the temptation to doubt. But believe in the things that have been put there through faith and it will be granted you. Therefore, I say to you, he goes on. So first have faith in God. I say to you, all things which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, that it's settled in heaven, and they will be granted you. So first, have faith in God. Second, have a prayer life. You must have a prayer life. And remember this. There's this withered fig tree sitting here, this object lesson to his disciples, and they're looking at it dead and never to bear fruit again. And Jesus is saying, have faith in God. Don't give up hope in God. In fact, you're called to have a resilient and resplendent faith, like a shining faith that others look at and say, wow, how do they believe like that? And it's just, they're just simply like a child. You know what I mean? My father said it, I believe it. And you're called to that kind of faith. And then he says, have a prayer life. And when you pray, let that faith that you have, like that faith feeds this thing. So now when you're praying, you're believing you're believing what faith has stirred and inspired in your heart to pray. You're believing that it will be done. In fact, that it has been done. Your word, O oh Lord, the scripture says, is settled in the heavens. Settled in the heavens. And so you and I are simply believing what God has said. So have a prayer life. And then he goes on from there. And notice how all these things just cleanly connect with one another. Verse 25, when you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven also will forgive you your transgressions and a stern caution. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. So have faith in God. 
have a prayer life and forgive one another. Practice forgiveness. Because what does the Bible say right here? Jesus said, he said this also when he was teaching them to pray. The only thing he, he, that he enlarged upon when he taught them what we call the Lord's Prayer, the only thing he enlarged upon was forgiveness. And he said the same thing. He said, your father will not forgive you if you don't forgive others from the heart. He taught a whole parable on it after. And here he says the same thing. Make sure you forgive other people. When you stand praying, what did Jesus say? You want to bring your gift to the altar and you realize you have something against your brother in your heart or your brother has something against you, go seek out your brother. Leave the gift. Don't give it yet. Leave the gift. Go be reconciled to your brother and then come make your offering. Didn't Jesus say that? These are hard teachings. Are they not hard teachings? I find them to be hard teachings. And yet, the fact of the matter is that unforgiveness toward others is a sin itself. So when you go to God and say, God, Forgive me for my sin because you need forgiveness and you know you need it. He looks in your hand and he sees all the people you're holding their transgressions against them. And he says, Jesus paid the price for your forgiveness. I'd never withhold that from you. Why are you withholding forgiveness from other people? What's in your hand? And it's the list of eight or ten people whose sins were too great for you to forgive. And he points at the cross and says, well, 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 let's just look at my son for a second. Your sins were very great. Did he hesitate? Did he hesitate to forgive you? Did he put you on a short leash? Did he put you on his watch list? Or did he just forgive you and let you go with no debt? You owe him nothing. And the answer is, of course, we were forgiven absolutely of everything. And so... He asks only that we do the same. So who owes you something? That's the way you figure out whether you've forgiven people or not. First of all, if when you talk about them, you go into a rage, you haven't forgiven them. I've heard a person screaming before, I have forgiven them. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, just to consider. And you're like, you know, ready to like looking for the exits. It's like, just consider this. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you haven't. And that's why you're so angry. So if your emotions are still tied to the event, and I mean, look, some things take a while to really work through, and I'm not discounting that. But, but if you consider in your mind anything that they still owe you, you have not forgiven them. If they owe you something as simple as an apology, you've not forgiven them. If they stole money from you and you want it back, you've not forgiven them. I'm just saying, you have to cancel debts. That's what Jesus said. He said, your debt was infinitely larger. Well, you don't know what they did to me. It doesn't matter. Your debt was infinitely larger because Jesus forgave all your sins, past, present, and future. Your accumulated debt is infinitely larger than any isolated event that anyone could have ever done to you. So what about you consider practicing the same kind of forgiveness that was shown to you? So Christians have to forgive. Godliness is forgiving people because that's, what's godliness? It's God-likeness. Being like God. And there's this extremely inconvenient verse in the Bible that says, created to be like God in all righteousness and holiness. Talking about us. Really an inconvenient verse when I need an out. Created to be like God in all righteousness and holiness. What does God do? Well, then I do the same. That's godliness. First of all, So let's cover these quick. The godly have faith, not just any faith. He's calling us to have unshakable, supernatural, mountain-moving faith in God. When your faith is mature, that's what it will look like. And so I just want to challenge you in that. Figure out where you're at in faith. Because the Bible says whoever comes to God must believe first that he exists. That's step one. But believing he exists doesn't mean that you're saved. Then it says you must believe he is a rewarder. Of those who diligently seek him. That's hard to believe if you're not saved. Somewhere, I think, between 1A and 1B is uh, salvation. Believing the gospel and understanding what's done for your soul. But then when you know him or are coming to know him, you have to believe that, those, that, um, that he's a rewarder. That means when you pray, when you seek him, God is going to hear. He's going to respond. He, it's, the Bible says unequivocally, you have to believe those things. 
So where are you at in, in the faith process? Do you believe God exists? Well, so do the demons, and they tremble. That's what James said. So that alone is not of itself able to save. But the belief that what he did at the cross was sufficient for your salvation is that Jesus paid it for you. Then you come to believe that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. But then do you believe that you could speak to the mountains? And of course, it's not literal mountains. It's, fi it's a figure of speech. What's the big thing in your life that's holding you back from God? What's the big thing in the way? You watch Jesus. And there were times that Jesus, he would pray. And then he would do something to heal somebody. And other times, you don't get a record that he prayed. And sometimes he would just speak to a sickness and say, come out. He didn't pray, Father, make the sickness go out. He just spoke to it, and it came out. Well, do you have faith that under God's direction, you could also speak in his authority, the authority given you in Christ? Is your faith there? Because Jesus is saying, he goes right from there. He says, have faith in God and speak to mountains. That's what Jesus said. And he said, that's going to be when your faith is reaching a place of maturity, when you can speak to the things in your life and say, Get out of here. You have no place in Jesus' name. Get out of my life. Speak to the sin that you can't seem to move. Speak to the problem. Speak to the stronghold. And command it to move. And he said, and if you believe and don't doubt in your heart, it'll be cast into the sea. Just as sure as God has spoken. Second, the faith of the godly expresses itself through a prayer life. A healthy prayer life full of faith is how God's kingdom comes into the earth through us. Jesus said, when you pray, in the Lord's Prayer, he said, first of all, give God his proper place. Acknowledge him. He's your father in heaven. You're here on earth. He said, so give God his proper place. And the very next thing you should begin to do with your prayers is to build the kingdom of God in the earth. The very next thing is to say, your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. How is the will of God done in heaven? It's done immediately. It's done all the way. The angels do not hesitate, but go like lightning to do his will, it says in Ezekiel. They pause, they listen, and when they've got their orders, they go like lightning to do his will. That's how the will of God is done in heaven. So how does he want it to be done in earth? Just like that. But it doesn't just say your will be done, it says your kingdom come. And this kingdom, come, kingdom comes as his servants are doing his will, like the angels do in heaven. And you and I have got to submit ourselves to God in that but it comes through a healthy prayer life. You are communing with God, which means set apart time, put it in your phone with an alarm, and get up. And go and be with Jesus. And be with Jesus till you either have to go because of circumstances or he releases you. But go and be with Jesus. Spend that time with him. Pray and be in the word of God and let him feed your spirit. If you're neglecting that today, if you're not spending time alone with God in your personal life, the great miracle will be if you're not in sin. That is the fact of the matter. If you are neglecting time alone with God to develop that relationship, the greatest miracle will be if you're not in sin. Because abiding with him looks like that. That's what it looks like. He said, abide in me. That's, like, that's so metaphysical. I don't know what that means. Yes, you do. Get up and read your Bible and talk to Jesus. Stay with him. Walk with him. Don't go anywhere else. Stay with him. That's what abide means. Remain. Remain. And you'll learn how to remain with him all day by setting apart that time in the morning. Then you walk out of your time with God, not leaving him there. See you later, Jesus, and he'll stay in your closet. No, you hold hands with him and you walk with him through the day. And that's how you live life. And that brings about a maturity and it keeps you out of sin. Anyways, lastly, the godly practice, abundant forgiveness. We seek it out when we need it, and we always seek to give it. We hold no grudges. How many grudges? No grudges. We, pr we pursue reconciliation. This is one of the most frustrating things about this whole thing. If you find out somebody else is mad at you, you've got to go to them. If you've hurt somebody else's feelings, you've got to go to them. And you know what I mean? You can hope the other person comes to you, and, and let, but to, you don't sit around and wait for other people to do what's right. You do what's right. If you come bringing your gift and you realize that your brother has something against you, it's like, yeah, but he's such a, he's so sensitive. Jesus says, leave your gift and go talk to him and be careful. He's sensitive. 
But you pursue reconciliation when you've hurt somebody and you pursue reconciliation when somebody's mad at you. Because people will be mad at you and you know what they do? They'll do? They will skulk for nine months. You walk into the, around the coffee bar area, they'll just... And you're sitting over here going, what an absolute baby. That's what you're thinking. Now, don't, I don't tell people that sometimes we think those things. But we do. And it's like, go seek them out and say... I feel like something's wrong in our relationship. Can we get together and talk? And you do it. You do it. If they refuse to, the Bible says, live at peace with others insofar as it depends on you, which means go and pursue that reconciliation. Pursue it till you hit a brick wall. And when you hit a brick wall, take a break. Come back, make your offering. God is pleased. But reach out again later and see. If they won't do it, they won't do it. But you can do what you can do. Does that make sense? But we pursue it and we offer forgiveness. <clears throat> These things, and we repent when we're wrong. This, this is immeasurably important. When you're wrong, don't explain why it is that, you're okay, that, that the wrong that you were was not as bad as other kinds of wrong that you could be. Have you ever gotten an apology like that? Well, I'm sorry, but... It's like, no, 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 just, just skip the explanation. Did you ever try this? Try this at work. Try it at home. Try it everywhere. Skip the explanation, and you will begin to succeed at repentance. No explanation. Don't give it. You probably got a couple of reasons you did, but don't, who cares? Nobody cares. In the moment, all you need to do is just say, you're right, I was wrong, and I'm sorry. And just let God defend you if, you had, if there was a better reason. But don't, don't do the explanation thing because it kind of undoes the repentance. These things are the precious possessions of the children of God. These things ensure that Jesus will receive the fruit he's seeking from the people he bought at so high a price. Have faith in God. Have a prayer life and forgive people. Does that seem like, this is kind of like Christianity 101, isn't it? This is the foundation of our faith. We believe in Jesus and out of that, out of that we have faith in God. Out of that, we, we love him, so we want to spend time with him, so we have a prayer life, and we want to see the kingdom come. And then we forgive people because we've been forgiven so much. And Jesus said, live like that, and the fruit tree of your life will always be bearing, even, get this, even when it's not the season for fruit. You will be bearing fruit. The master will be able to come to you at any time and call for fruit, and there it'll be, even out of season, because you're living an upright and a godly life. Now hear me, this is all a function of the grace of God. The grace of God works with your works, and God gets all the glory. But you can have faith in God by the grace of God. You can have a prayer life by the grace of God. And you can forgive other people. And if you don't have enough grace to forgive, you feel like, I just can't forgive this person, then use your prayer life with faith, to go back to the presence of God, to the throne of grace, to get more grace. And when you've received more grace, go forgive. These things are tied to each other and they're inseparable. Amen? Let's stand up. We're out of time. I mean, the worship team needs a heads up. That's what the, If I had an earpiece, that's what they would have just told me. But let's do go ahead and stand up. If I want to have time, we need to close the service. We need to have an update about Kathy. Um... But I want to give us a second to just be in the presence of the Lord and sort some things out. So I want to ask this question. Have you become faithless? Can you run that back for me today? I'm, I'm, we're wrapping this up. Have you become faithless? Have you run into a wall with your faith where you're just not believing God anymore? You stumble over everything that requires faith. You become too practical. Have you become prayerless? Have you left, have you abandoned your post, your time on the wall as a watchman for God? Have you walked away from that? Has your prayer life lost all passion, all zeal, all focus, or have you given up on it entirely? Have you become unforgiving? What I want to say, just remember the height from which you've fallen. Because you know there was a day when you were full of faith, you were eager to pray, and you were forgiving people, even great transgressions, because you knew what you'd been forgiven of. If we're living like this, we're not living a godly life. It's time to reunite with Jesus. It's just time. You are walking in these things, and God bless you, because your life is currently a blessing to other people. 
and you will not know until heaven how many lives your life has touched. Jesus healed 10 lepers, only one came back to say thank you. And that'll probably be something like your experience. Your godly life will touch 10 lives, you'll find out about one and find out about the rest in heaven. Or maybe you'll never find out and that's okay because it all belongs to Jesus anyway. He gets all the praise. I wanna call you to the altar today to pray. We're gonna have a time of worship. And I just want to encourage you to come and pray. If you need, it's time for restoration. It's time to get back with God. If you know, you've not been alone with God in months, weeks, months, whatever it's been, years. You've not prioritized the time alone with God to pray and to seek his face. If you know that faith is just failing on every side, you need the Lord to touch you, you really do. And if you've got unforgiveness in your heart and you just can't let it go, you've tried, you've tried, you've tried, you've tried, but you just need grace. You don't have the grace to forgive. Well, then come and pray. Come and pray and let our prayer team, prayer teams, come on up. And if you would, just be ready to pray over people. And listen, when they come to pray, just tell them exactly what's going on and let them just, let them lift it up for you. And God will work in your life. So let's take that time now and just be with Jesus. Zach's going to sing over us. And just come as the song is playing. Just come. Lord, lead us in your ways. And give us strength and courage, Lord, to enter into your presence and to receive from your hand all the grace that we need to live a godly life before you. And may we put our hands to the plow and never look back. And we know that you'll sustain us through it in Jesus' name. Amen.